I'm going to say this without being hurtful. Listen to me. Too many of us, I say us, what's us mean? Being inclusive, right? Too many of us allow the trials and the hardships in our lives to define who we are. When I coached, this is so odd for some of you who have never been involved in sports, but when I coached, you could have a kid who was a big, strong, gifted athlete, but because he was beat up as a child, meaning verbally abused somehow, he was never, never quite all he could be because he wasn't confident in how God had made him. Maybe daddy had beat him down, and he was constantly worried about failing, therefore he didn't succeed much. Lisa, where are you at? Raise your hand. All right. Your Uncle Earl Leggett told a story about Howie Long. Anybody know who Howie Long is? Howie Long was all-pro defensive tackle for the Raiders. Well, Lisa's Uncle Earl coached for the Raiders. And every year, Howie Long would come in and say, uh, Coach Leggett, do you, you think I'll make the team this year? All pro football player. Now, I'm not talking bad about Howie Long. There's a difference in being beat down and not having confidence and being worried that you're performing to peak you know, each and every year. Howie wanted to make sure that he was at peak each and every year. That's what made him good. He was, he was big and he was strong, but work ethic made Howie Long great, right? So the contrast to that is there are people who have a certain level of giftedness and because they've been beat up, they never fulfill that. And there are those folks who have maybe less giftedness, but because they're driven to be successful, they, they do much more. And somewhere down the line, we get defined by our hardships and our, our successes. I thought about my grandfather, um, who grew up in the Depression. And there's not many Depression-age people here anymore, meaning, uh, you'll see, who was born in the Depression, remembers the Depression? Anybody? Miss Pearly Perry. And how old, Miss Pearly? Right in the middle of it. And you remember lots of things about it, don't you? Yeah. My grandfather was eight years old when his, when his dad died. And then he was... Uh, 12 years old when he went to work like a man in the log woods and by the time he was 14 his mother was dead and I can remember being 14 or 15 years old and my grandfather standing there leaning on the gate looking out into the pasture with his cows and saying son I don't I hope I can just I hope I can make my land note this year I hope I can make, and it made me worry about being able to pay the land note so I mentioned it to my dad. I said, Daddy, I'm worried about Paul. Paul's worried about making a land note. And my dad said, Son, don't worry about that. Your grandfather has plenty of money to pay the land note. But because he grew up in the Depression and, and an extra hard time in the Depression, he constantly focused on not having enough. Somebody's going to come and take the land. Somewhere down the line, he must have had family members lose land because they couldn't pay taxes and those kind of things. And, you know, Shot knows this about me. I have a, uh, I kind of have a lust problem. Before you get, let your head play out, it's on land. I want the land that I own and what's next to it. Whatever touches it is what I want. And I've had that problem for a long time, but I'm about to get over it. And that came from my grandfather who constantly said to me, Son, if you got land, you got something. Buy land, buy land, buy land. So he was, he was defined by his life and going through a hardship. It drove him to have more than he needed. It drove him to, to always have plenty of food in the house, always you know, be looking ahead, to always have a huge garden. You know, and I'm not against a garden, but I'm telling you what, if I can get it at Natchez Market, that's where I go. I hate, a, I hate working in the garden because we had a big garden. Huh? Anybody grew up in a garden? How many people loved a garden? Not so many. Right? Nothing wrong with loving the garden. I just don't. 
So when we look at our lives, our lives either refine us, and I'll talk about that in just a minute, or they define us. Well, I'm going to say that your life does not define you. It refines you. Your life does not define who you are. Your hardships do not define who you are. They refine you. Now, in just a minute, I'm going to share some information from sociology today. Uh, so, excuse me, psychology today. Yeah, psychology today. And we found out that two-thirds of people who go through bad things allow it to shape who they are and make them less productive. Let's put it that way. So, let me go ahead. I want to talk about refining. Now, when we talk about refining gold, it's a process of heat, pressure, and a kind of more complex uh, adding to removing impurities. So there's heat and there's pressure, and they remove impurities. And, it, and that's actually not just called uh, refining, it's called uh, a smelting of gold. You refine gold by smelting it. Smelting it is more than melting it. It is going through a process of crushing it down, heating it up, burning away the impurities, and then adding things that makes it better. Chemicals that help to burn off the slag and the bad parts. That's smelting. Now, Scripture talks about gold and the process of gold like this. Zechariah 13.9 says this about gold and about refinement. This third I will bring into the fire. I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. Now, he's talking about a group of people. Okay, a remnant. They will call on my name and I will answer them and I will say, they are my people. And they will say, the Lord is our God. So this is a refinement. Now you have to understand that Israel is, is under persecution right now. And God is pulling out a third, which is really, really cool because I told you in the psychology today that two-thirds of the people allow things to be negative and impact them in a negative way. So one-third came out better by the pressure and the hardship that they went over. Uh, another scripture is Isaiah 48 and 10 says this about refinement. See, I have refined you. Though not as silver, I have tested you in the firmest furnace of affliction. All this imagery, if you can watch the video, I started getting to be able to pull them up, but I only feel they were like five minutes long, and I didn't have that, that amount of time to, to do that. Intense heat. You start this thing out, the refinement, there's crushing, and then intense heat, like in a furnace. Last scripture on refinement. Job 20, 23 and 10. But he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. You see, God is continually refining his people, making them better. And, and it happens through hardship. So let me move along here. Now, whenever we look at this process... Uh, it's, it's not just melting gold down, it's smelting. And I talked about smelting, and smelting is pressure, and it's heat, and it's removing the impurities by adding to and making the gold that's inside the rocks valuable. Now, it already has value. A, you know, if you find a, a gold ore, you've got value. But what makes it useful is when you remove the junk that's with it. Y'all hang on to that word. Ready? Look up here. Look at me. We get refined when we remove the junk. And you get it out of your life. So many of us hang on to the junk and it defines how we operate. We continue to stay where we were and in that wound. How many people have a wound? You don't, yes. Raise your hand. 
Have you ever been wounded by anybody? Those that didn't raise your hand, you're just not telling the truth. You got wounds. Somebody has hurt you in some way. Maybe you didn't spend a whole lot of time on it, and God bless you to that person. But for a lot of people, a wound stays there for a while. Because about the time it gets healed up, somebody comes along and goes, Hey, what is that? And they tear the scab off. Right? I remember being a kid, we didn't wear many shoes back in the day because I grew up on the dirty road and it just was not the thing we did on the dirty road. We were measured by if we could run down a gravel road without shoes. Anybody else? I remember going to school, having to wear shoes and getting sad that my feet would get soft again. I felt like I had been diminished because my feet, my calluses were going away. And I was, I use an old term, I was a tenderfoot, right? But back in the day, what would happen is we would run around without shoes, and you always going to knock a toenail off, or you're going to stub your toe, or you're going to cut it on something, you're going to step on, I, man, I always hated stepping on a nail, because I don't remember, it seemed like I got a tetanus shot every year, you're supposed to have one like every five years, but we never, they, could, they could never remember when I had a tetanus shot, so it was like, you stepped on a nail at the barn, let's go get a tetanus shot. I might have one like yesterday, I'm pretty sure. And they're going to get a tetanus shot. Don't want to get the lock jaw. You can't eat then. I'm like, okay, I'll get my tetanus shot. <laughs> How many people heard of lock jaw when you was a kid? That was a terrible sounding disease. You can't eat. I thought, maybe I could just knock a tooth out and I can suck it through a straw. Yeah. Point is, with all that... We had scabs and we had wounds and we had in injuries. And about the time it would heal up, you would kick your foot on something and you'd knock the scab off or tear it off and you'd be wounded all over again. And that's how we operate in the world. Sometimes people, certain people, are really good about re-wounding us. Amen. When I say really good, I don't mean good. I mean they're really talented at it. It's a bad thing for us. And we allow that stuff to define how we Look at life. I told you that I saw children that were gifted, bright children, smart, beautiful children, and they came to school and they would look, oh man, I'll tell you, break your heart. I worked at the Baptist Children's Home. Some of the most beautiful, intelligent children you ever saw. And they were just almost mortally wounded by an adult who had abused them or neglected them in some way. It was a rare child that moved beyond their abuse to become what God had intended for them to be. I wasn't saved then, but I would get so mad that by state law we would have to send those kids back home for about four weeks in the summer. And they would try to do the best, and they would send them to, with grandma or whatever. But you know what grandmas do? Grandmas give them back to the children because grandmas and grandpas think that their children are okay. And they send their grandchildren back to the child that abused that child. And that young person would come back, back in a shell, crushed again, wounded again, about the time... You would love them into seeing their potential, they would be rewounded. And it's how they talked about themselves. And child abusers became child abusers. Children of alcoholics became alcoholics. Children of drug abusers became drug abusers. You take your choice. But then every once in a while, there was that rare child that recognized his or her potential, and they came out of there, and they went to college, and, and you would see them later, and they say, Coach, they called me Coach Bo back then. Coach Bo, do you remember me? And I'm like, I'm so-and-so. You, you, you were at the children's home when I was there. Well, you know, I'm 50 years old, and now they're, you know, 35, 40, because I wasn't much older than them. I mean, they, some of these are junior high and high school kids, and I'm, I'm in college, Right? And I said, 
oh yeah, well let me, let me introduce you to my wife. This is my son. And you're like, oh, that is so good. You know? They did not allow their hardship to define how they operated. Let me, let me share this with you. Now, in this process of smelting or refinement, you see, things get better. Things get better. We, we know that through the process of smelting that we remove impurities. I'm going somewhere, so you hang on to that. We remove impurities. All right? Then we make it more pure. The first process is you remove the, the big rock, right? All the stuff, and you get just the gold. And then you remove all the small impurities. And in the very end, it comes out of the furnace 99.9% .9 pure gold. So did you hang on to that? We remove the big stuff. Then we refined it by removing the little stuff. And then when we pour it out, it becomes 99.9% .9 pure gold. Useful for everything from making jewelry to medical things. All right. So follow me. We are in a process of refinement as Christians, all right, as people. Because not everybody here is a Christian. The first thing we do is... We get saved, and that means we get justified, and God removes the big barrier between us and Him. He removes the rock in our heart, and we accept Christ. When you take gold, you remove the stone, the rock that is bound to that gold. Sometimes the gold is buried inside the rock. You crush the rock, you move the rock, you get the gold. All right. That's justification. That means salvation through Jesus Christ. You are justified by Christ, not by your own work. Amen. All right, so this is part of the process. So when we look at what Jesus does, it's very much this process of smelting. It's refining. It's removing the big stuff from us, justification. Next, there's sanctification. What does sanctification mean? It means to be made holy. Four people know. Awesome. Awesome. And I had like 20 in my class on Wednesday night, and we just talked about it. So sanctification means that we start to remove the little things that separate us from God, the, the small things. We're justified, we're saved, and then we start working on being sanctified. We start to be made holy. You follow me? The little impurities in our life, the little things, the, the things that we hang on to after salvation, we... You know what mine was? Alcohol. Love me some beer. And I wanted to hang on to that. And every time I hung on to that impurity in my life, I acted like a fool. Now, Brother Bo, the Bible don't say don't drink. It does say don't get drunk. Gotcha. How about that? Got me. And the last part is glorification. That's when we're made completely holy with God, that we get our glorified bodies. And that's the part of the process. Now, what we see is that God is at work, and He is justifying us, He's sanctifying us, and He is going to glorify us when we get to be with Christ. Now, what we see for a lot of folks is that whenever they are in abused situations, or hardship, or somebody has damaged them, they seek out unhealthy relationships. Anybody? Anybody ever watch somebody seek out unhealthy relationships because you've got some kind of complex or some kind of, um, wow, I won't, I won't even call it, there's so many insecurities, I'll, I'll do that. You've got insecurities because somebody has hurt you, all right, we'll leave it there. And what happens is we usually start to seek out the kind of relationship that we grew up in, we seek out the people uh, that... People like the people who hurt us because it's normal for us, it's natural for us, and we stay locked in what we were. We're either being victims or we're victimizing the people we're around. Now, but we're not called to allow those hardships 
to give us insecurities or to cripple us or define who we are. We're actually called above that and beyond that. But I want to share with you what psychology today said. Psychology today said that uh, the question was, do our hardships make us wiser? That was the, that was the psychology today. Do our hardships make us wiser? And for two-thirds of the people in America, the answer is no. Do our hardships make us wiser? Do our hardships make us better? For two-thirds of the people, the answer is no. That leaves one-third of the people who take that situation, and they are not defined by that hardship. They are refined. They get better. They learn from whatever they went through. I, I take you back to... The scripture where he says, I'm going to save a third out. And I'm going to refine that third. And I'm going to bless that third. Interesting that psychology today finds that two-thirds fall to the wayside, but one-third come out better. Right? God kind of has a way of doing that. You would think that I had to look, look for that. No, that's just me reading and there it was. I'm like, well, that's really cool. Because I just read the scripture said, well, I, I'm going to save a third. And then there's a third of the people who come out of hardship that come out better because they learn from the things they went through. So, two-thirds have a negative look on life. They have a negative outcome of what they went through. But one-third comes out much better. They come out positive. They take that bad thing that happened to them and they let it to refine them and make them better. It's the people who say, I went through this, therefore I'm working with these children where they can never go through that again. Amen. I've been through this, so I'm doing this thing for this group so that that group will never be crippled like I was. They allow God to work through their hardships to better them. Amen. We have a habit. <laughs> this is going to be hurtful. Scripture says that once a, once a pig is washed, so often it goes back to the wallow. Someone said, why would you wash a pig? I don't know, but Scripture says that sometimes when you wash your pig, that it goes back to the mud. Okay? That's how it is with us sometimes in the church. We get saved. We start moving ahead, doing good, and then suddenly something comes and trips us up, and we go back to the same thing that we were in before. Maybe that's not you. That was me. I did that a lot. I would get under pressure, and all of a sudden I would doubt what God was doing. Anybody ever doubt what God is doing with something? Amen? So you want to get your pity party going? Anybody ever getting a good pity party? Any pity party? I listened to a pastor talking about that uh, yells all the time. Uh, Joyce Myers, thank you. Joyce Myers said that she, that she was having a pity party one time. She said, I will tell you that it was before Jesus. She said, it wasn't. I was even preaching and said, my kids were outside playing. My husband's watching TV. And she said, I'm walking around the house vacuuming noisy. You know, she's like slamming the vacuum into everything. And her husband, you know, she's like, she said, I'm causing a disruption because I want him to notice that I'm being offended by what he's doing, that he's enjoying himself. And I don't want him to enjoy himself because he needs to suffer like I'm suffering. So she says, I vacuumed loud and I slammed around. I put the vacuum up and I walked in the living room and I looked at him. I'm waiting for him to notice that I'm there. And he says, hey, would you bring me some sweet tea, please? She says, so I went to the bathroom and I laid on the commode and cried. She said, why would you lay on a commode and cry? She said, then I got up and I looked in the mirror and my eyes were all swollen, so I cried some more. Listen, there's sometimes that little things can make us start to have a, a, a pity party and we want other people to address, to notice that we're in a pity party. Anybody? Amen. And if people aren't sensitive enough to our needs, then we're mad because they didn't notice that we're having a hard time. 
Girls, I'll tell you this. I'm going to talk to the guys, too. Your husband is not real bright, your, your boyfriend, your significant other. He's not bright. Amen, ladies? You want him to know something? Tell him. I am mad at you for this reason. And he's going to go, what? Oh, I ain't done nothing to you. Here's the answer, guys. And you haven't done anything for her either. Amen? Uh-oh, it's getting messy back here. I got people going, yeah, boy, listen. Listen to me. It's our nature when things go south to get back in, in, into a pity party and to go back to where we came from. We weren't designed to stay where we are. We're designed to get better. That's part of that thing that we call sanctification. We get saved and then we start growing. And listen, that old stuff that used to define who we were, it starts to burn off. That's, that's how it happens. It's, it starts to burn away. And it becomes less and less of who we are. And at the end, we become pure and useful. Not because of what we've done, but because of what Christ is doing in us. Church, don't allow your hardships, don't allow your burdens, don't allow those things that you went through to define who you are. You, let them refine who you are. To make you better, to look back and go, hey, I was there and now I'm here and I'm going there. Again, for those who are slow, I was there. I'm here and I'm going there. We're not, we're not designed to stay in the wallow. I told you in uh, Psychology Day that two-thirds had a negative view of the hardships, but one-third did not. Here's, here's the difference. Romans 12, 2 says that we are to renew our mind. Okay? It says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. The difference in the two-thirds and the one-third was a different way of looking at things. What can I learn from what I've been through? How can I be better? When we apply what Christ has done for us, when we apply Scripture to our lives, we see that God is using whatever Satan meant to harm you with to build you up. You should know the Scripture by heart. Romans 8 and 20 what? Romans 8? Sad. God works through all things. Romans 8 and 28, God works through all things to benefit those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Right there. We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him and have been called according to His purpose. You are a people of purpose. God has a plan for you. And the way you look at what God is doing, that's what changes everything. The way you look at what God is doing, that's what changes everything. God, God is not punishing you God is using your situations, and sometimes those self-inflicted wounds, can we talk about, anybody ever have a self-inflicted wound, right? It's kind of like my dad saying, now son, don't try to run down that levee, you won't be able to stop. I tell you, the levee is a wonderful place. You know, I, I grew up in very, you, you people who grew up in the hills, you're used to this stuff. A fat kid who, who don't have a hill in sight around his place, Man, I got on the levee and I looked down and said, I bet I can run all the way to the bottom. I took off my little fat legs. Pretty soon, I just hit the ground. Bam! And I just start rolling. And I roll all the way to a briars and a barbed wire fence and I'm just hung there. You know what my dad says? Told you, son, don't run down the levee. I'm skin up all over. There's no pity from daddy. Because daddy said what? Don't do that. 
I'm telling you this story because I know better now. And I say to my sons, don't run down that levee. If I had a dime for every time I told Leanna, don't run, you're going to fall. Every time. Janice, you say don't run, she runs harder. Giggling. Hits the ground, jumps up. <laughs> Told you. Told you. You see, God is making you into something more than you could have ever been by yourself. It says this in 1 Peter 2 and 9. Get this so that you'll understand who you are in Christ. But you are a chosen people. Read that with me. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into wonderful light. You're a chosen people. Your hardships are just part of the process. They're not who you are. They're part of making you who you are and who you will be. Amen? You're refined. You're loved. You're God's special possession. Stand with me. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that you love us.